I just wanted to say on behalf of the Sussex Conservation District and the Delaware Soil Health Partnership that I wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, there's a lot of virtual meetings taking place right now and some of us have had more than our fair share of Zoom. So I appreciate everybody that's willing and able to join in. For today's panel, we have Steve Groff, who will be moderating the discussion and sharing some of his own experiences. We have Aaron Thompson from Hartley, Delaware, Steve Krzyzewski from Mason's Heritage Farm in Queen Anne's County, Maryland, and Blaine Hitchens from Laurel, Delaware. Our topics will focus on the intersections between soil health, precision ag, biological amendments, and organic production. So what we'll do is to give each of our presenters a chance to introduce themselves and to talk about their farm and their management practices. Steve will start the conversation with each panelist and after some brief discussion, we'll open up for a few questions from the audience. So just for a couple of logistics, you can use the chat box to ask questions. And then after all the presenters are done, we should have some time for open discussion with everyone. And also, if everybody can start by putting themselves on mute so that we don't have a lot of background noise or feedback, that would be really helpful to maintain clarity and, and be able to hear everybody. So finally, I posted up a link in the survey chat box uh, to a survey in the chat box. You can open that link in a, a new tab now uh, to help remind yourself to get back to that later on today. So if this discussion spurs any ideas for topics or speakers that you'd like for us to include in future events, this is where you can let us know. And also by filling out the survey, we'll have your information to send you a link to the recording from today's discussion once that's posted. I'll also try to remember to post that link in the chat box again at the end of our meeting for everybody's convenience. So with that, I would like to introduce Steve Groff. Steve is the cover crop coach and a farmer from Pennsylvania who's a pioneer in cover crop management and no-till farming. We've had him speak at a few of our events in the past and he graciously agreed to help guide the discussion today. So Steve, I'm gonna turn it over to you and thank you. Well, you're quite welcome, Jen. And uh, just always glad to <clears throat> gather together creative thinking, innovative minds. And uh, so I think the objective today is we have three uh, producers that are gonna be sharing some of their experience. And I would just say we're going to take a question or two after each one, but not many, just a question or two. Maybe, Jen, you could maybe feed them. Uh, I might be watching the chat. Um, uh, we'll, we'll work that out then. But we're going to start with Aaron Thompson. And uh, so um, a little bit about Aaron's farm. I'm not going to say much, but some of the focuses that they do is precision agriculture, manure management since they have um, a lot of poultry manure to deal with and soil health. So, um, so Aaron, maybe you wanna tell us just a tad more about your farm and um, tell a little bit about you know, what you're doing, what things that uh, you would like to share with us uh, today about how you feel that we can help other farmers. So go for it, Aaron. Uh, we've started uh, 20 years ago with minimal till and, and experimented with some cover crops back then as well, but it really ramped them up over the years. Uh, this past year, we were about 95, 98% cover crops. Generally, what wasn't in wheat had cover crops on it. Um, we've done a lot with rye. I've had some um, challenges with rye, but I'm getting more into mixtures um, with radish, rape, and rye, uh, some wheat blended in there. And we have also went with uh, rye and clover. Uh, we have a lot of low land, so the rye kind of is definitely usually comes up if some of the other species don't survive. So at least we have something growing on there. Um, the rye we kind of use as a uh, carrier to help spread the small seeds out better. So those, those are some of the things we're working at currently. So just um, maybe go ahead and talk about your precision agriculture. How are you using precision, precision agriculture, I guess more or less in the context of our topic today here, soil health, you know, cover crops and that kind of stuff. How, how is precision, precision agriculture used in your farm? Well, we have a lot of older equipment that we, we have retrofitted for uh, precision equipment. This year we just built our own corn planter. Um, using some precision technology with uh, smart insecticide boxes in for two by two by two by two on each side 
um, different different info mixtures that we experiment with for soil health, um, working with humic acids in furrow. Uh, we also uh, we spread manure with uh, auto steer um, and and wanting to go to swath control on that as well. We have scales that we actually scale our spreaders in our manure so we get an accurate um, spread so our, our target rate comes out correctly. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things that we do that we feel lends the soil health actually is, is good spreading of the manure, good even spread. We spend a lot of time getting manure from different sources from different farms and we'll blend, bring manure in together at one pile and blend it so we get the right the right moisture ratio for the right spreading. Um, we use and yield monitor data to collect our data and then using the harvest data for planting maps for population. Um, so we're generally upping our population. We got higher yields. Um, take the soil types into consideration there as well and woods edges and and we're also planting. We have multi-hybrid on our planter and we're planting some corn hybrids that deer doesn't like as much around the woods and then the, the other hybrids inside that. Could you, could you talk a little bit more about how manure management and cover crops interrelate to one another? How do you, how do you manage, I could come out both ways here, how do you manage cover crops and manure? How, how do they go together in, in your operation? Okay. Well, generally, I, I probably should have started by saying generally we're a third, third, third. So we're a third corn, third full season soybeans, and then a third wheat follows by the full season soybeans to have double crop soybeans. Mm -hmm. So what we've been trying to do is basically all the soil every 18 months gets manure. So we spread a smaller amount in the fall on the wheat, and then the corn ground gets it in the spring. So the land gets uh, manure every 18 months. Uh, the, the manure adds a lot of benefit to the soil with the, the bacteria in it that I think just work well uh, with the soil and the soil biology getting with the, along with the cover crops and the root systems the whole system just works well together it just fits like a hand in a glove. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mentioned you're doing some cover crop mixes with oil seed rape and a couple other things there what, what do you want to what do you see changing maybe this fall? Are you going to try something new, a new species or a new mix? Just kind of curious where you're at with that. Well, the clover we had tried last year was an earlier ripening clover, and uh, that seemed to do pretty well. Uh, we did have a lot flown on last year, and we had mixed results with that as, as it was dry. Um, but I'm anxious to look to see how that's going to go. Um, and then in the beginning, we used to use a lot of rye, and we've backed off. Like I said earlier, the rape and the radish, um, targeting them more, but just like a little bit of rye out there, we've get really good weed suppression from rye, even in a smaller rate it, or a smaller amount. It doesn't take a lot really to kind of suppress yeah. the weed pressure. Yeah, especially because you, it sounds like you've got plenty of nutrients there with the manure, it's gonna grow, right? That's right. Yeah. We've, seen, we've seen our soil health it really uh, expand it's really taken off and it doesn't take a lot of rye and if it's warm it'll tiller and it it can look like you put two bushel out there when you have 40 pounds yeah and I'm gonna agree with that as, as I've seen my own self and as I get around it seems like I'll call them the veteran cover croppers those that have done this for a while are actually lowering their seeding rates of their cover crops. The exception would be if you're doubling it up and using those cover crops for forage. That would be an exception probably. Right. But, um, but yeah, especially something like rye has the ability to tiller. Radishes have the ability to take up a lot of nutrients. The tubers just get bigger. They're like nutrient tanks. If you have time, you know, to grow in the fall uh, to absorb, you know, any nutrients that are in that soil profile. So maybe, uh, Aaron, we're, we're probably going to come around later again, but maybe a final question for you right now. And I, I know you didn't really prepare for this, but I'm just thinking, because I know we got a lot of people here on this call that are influencing other farmers or actually just curious. Any kind of advice that you would give uh, any farmer or anybody who's helping farmers on, on how to... Um, where to start with cover crops? What, what would you tell someone who said, you know what, I'm interested in this, I've read about them everywhere, 
Um, so what would you tell someone to say, where, where would be a good place to start? Maybe a scenario that comes to mind for you. Just curious what you might have to say on that. I would probably just start with some cereal grains and keep it simple. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest challenge you always have, though, is, is termination time in the spring. Mm -hmm. I think that's where there's some learning curves. Um, if you have a field that's fairly weedy, I would suggest burning it off uh, with Roundup or something that, to take to allow the wheat or rye or whatever cereal you're planting a chance to grow. Right. So um, we have time, but I think I want to take a little time for a question or two. Um, I uh, don't know if anybody was monitoring the chat there. I don't know, Jen, if you could. Is, is there a question on the chat that sticks out to you that maybe uh, that Aaron would be good to answer? One so far that specifically for Aaron, uh, can you talk about how he incorporates manure? Okay. Okay, sure. We have, we have three tillage tools that we use. We have an airway, a CCT airway, a turbo till, and an ultra till. So if you think of them from like um, our airways are heavier tillage tool that at times if we have some heavier clay or new ground that's harder, we'll run our airway. Uh, if the ground's a little bit damp um, and doesn't want to put the weight on it, uh, even with the turbo till, we'll run the ultra till for light incorporation. Uh, on our better drain soils, lighter soils, the ultra till works excellent for that because it incorporates it about an inch, but we're not working in our seed corn planting zone. So we use one of the three tools depending on the soil moisture and what we're trying to accomplish. Anybody else have a quick question for Aaron before we move on to Steve? Uh, you have to unmute yourself to ask it. Uh, don't be shy. Anybody else have a quick question for Aaron uh, based on what he does, precision agriculture, manure management, and cover crops and so forth? Anyone? Okay, we're not gonna linger long. Um, uh, let's go to Steve. And Steve, I'm not sure if you can tell me your last name when you come on, I don't wanna butcher it up. So Steve is from um, Roosburg, Maryland. And uh, he's in the process of considering to transition to an organic farm, to organic farm production. So um, tell us a little bit about, you know, where you're coming from there, uh, Steve, and that, and where, where you would like to go. Uh, and, you know, let's just, uh, hear a little bit about your um, your context there and what you're trying to do. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Uh, thanks uh, very much, and, and um, you know, thanks for this opportunity to let me speak and talk to everyone. Uh, yeah, uh, here in, in Roosburg in Maryland, um, the organic operation uh, started out about 2006 with my father-in-law, Bill Mason. He, he decided that he was uh, tired of writing checks and would rather receive more of them. Um, I think I'm stealing that from somebody's other talk. So, you know, uh, writing, yeah, I'd rather receive checks than write them. But uh, the conventional production side of things, uh, especially after some, I think a few hurricanes early in the, uh, the uh, 2000s, um, really made them sh make a shift in the way they wanted to produce and organic uh, seemed like a, a good way to go. A slow transition starting with 50 to 100 acres and even, even being able to pick up a farm that was ready to be certified uh, nearby was definitely a, a, a nice option uh, for my father-in-law because I didn't show up to the scene until two, end of 2008, beginning of 2009. And uh, they'd already been going through uh, the first round of transitioning some of the own, their own ground here on the farm. So not everybody's gonna have that situation though where you have uh, someone local uh, that you know, uh, a local farmer friend that's willing to um, sign over their, their farm to organic production and um, and start off, you know, hitting the ground running there. Uh, but uh, still the, the decision to keep transitioning ground that was in conventional production that started with, like I said, 100 acres and now the home farm being a total of about 600 tilbo till acres, which is all converted now, all converted to transition and mm -hmm. a couple other local farms that we rent, um, which had to also be uh, converted over that three year transition process. Um, was certainly a, a good move and it's 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 paid off ever since with the the fact that organic uh production and organic market uh just seems to have a little more stability than the conventional market uh where at, uh, you can they can compare a few things about the inputs uh, with conventional versus organic organics a little bit higher if you look at the numbers um but where it really pays off 
is that price per bushel that we're getting uh, uh, per or for the corn or soybeans or even small grain. It's, um, it's, it's definitely, it, it boosts our income and it gives us a little bit more flexibility and more consistency, uh, especially with the price that we get um, and uh, what we're able to uh, bring in. So Steve, just a quick question on, um, are you using cover crops in this transition? Just some ideas that seem to be working or maybe a failure that didn't work. I mean, it's always good to know. Uh, what doesn't work, but uh, talk to us about how cover crops are uh, in, involved in this transition. Uh, yes, cover crops are um, a big key. Uh, we participate in the Maryland Max program, uh, cover crop program, uh, where we sign up our acres every year. And depending on whether, uh, depending on if we're coming from corn to beans or beans to corn, it's a two-year, it's a two, two crop rotation. Uh, here on the farm. We've grown small grains before. Lately, uh, we haven't since some of the demand has kind of fallen by the wayside, uh, or at least we're not sure what the demand might be, at least for the small grains. So for now, um, that's taken, that's been put to the side, but cover crops still play a big role in all of our, of what we grow. Since you did mention, uh, you know, do I have a failure to, to, to give you an example about that just this year, we had some ground, it was a late field. It's our last farm. You typically get to some heavier ground and um, the rye didn't, we put down rye in the fall, like I said, but it was later. We put down as much as we could, two and a half bushels an acre. And just due to the, the cold spring and, um, and just being a little wetter, being a little later, uh, I was worried that it wouldn't have the, the growth, the biomass to lay over and, and um, give us that good ground cover, that good weed, mat, weed suppression that we're looking for. Uh, so I thought maybe putting in something early in March when I actually did decide to start warming up, uh, we got had a, a window. We found some um, some rapeseed, uh, vetch, and actually it was just those two: rapeseed and, and vetch to put in something that would come on in the spring with the rye before the rye really started to get going. And this idea almost worked. It was idea to help uh, supplement the biomass uh, for the rye. Uh, that was coming on and there's probably only one corner of the field it's about 130 acres this farm one corner of the field where it actually did work where i saw the results <laughs> it was supposed to that was really supposed to happen or what i expected to happen uh it was it was definitely worth trying though these were this was a no-till farm we one we were planning on no-till beans which we ended up doing anyway the ride did fairly well it could have done better but this was just an opportunity to see well maybe this could have been a, a rescue planting like i said in the spring uh that could yeah it could bolster that rye cover crop give a little more biomass. If the rye still hadn't uh, wanted to do much, maybe that extra the growth from the vetch could help roll things down and keep things at least down on the ground where it needs to be instead of sometimes springing back up and not really creating that, uh, that mulching, of that weed mat that you're looking for. So there was an example of something that almost worked. You know, good intentions in theory, it should have gone well, but I think it was just a few of the factors, especially the cooler spring we had in the late, the late spring uh, contributed, it just didn't quite uh, pan out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll comment on that about the vetch, the hairy vetch being it's kind of a viney type crop. When you do roll crimp, um, it does help keep other crops from springing back up, as you said, and that's that's something I've noticed over the years. One of the things I know that is challenging in organic is, uh, is the, uh, the way you get nitrogen, like to grow your corn. So how do you address that? In the organic situation, how do you get your nitrogen to grow your corn? Uh, typically, what we've done on the farm here is uh, usually most of our ground. And typically, if you're talking from a, a sense of uh, conventional soybean ground, by the end of September, with the Max Maryland Max uh, cover crop program, you get you get paid a rate to fly on your cover crop. It has to be a little bit higher since it's not being incorporated. Mm -hmm. But uh, typically, in with uh, organic production, your ground has usually been worked usually at least once for weed control. So it means your ground is loosened up. It's got some texture to it um, where seeds can find a little niche. And if you're talking about a, cle a seed like red clover, very, very small seed, um, usually that establishes uh, fairly well. And what we'll have, we'll have done is an airplane will fly it on most of our acres. And we'll, uh, when the beans come off, you'll always have a little bit of growth there because by the end of September, uh, when it's flown on the leaves, everything's done, basically done growing. And some of the leaves start to uh, senesce and start to fall off and drop, which opens up the canopy, which allows that cover crop to get a little start. You don't get a whole lot of growth, but you get enough uh, there uh, in the understory down by 
down at the ground, you know, maybe two or three inches. And when you pass over the combine, you see a nice shade of green. And that's the start of your clover cover crop, which will come on the following spring. And crimson clover being a, um, an annual comes on very quickly. And usually by the end of April, beginning of May, it's ready to be terminated. And that's where we get most of our nitrogen. Um, but um, what we've noticed though, is sometimes we have a weed problem. It's not the same every year. If we have a grass problem, we'll know we've noticed we've had problems establishing our cover crop. So what we're gonna try this year is to still fly on a small grain as per the, the cover crop program, and then come in later after the beans come off with Austrian winter peas uh, and get that established as we've tried that several different, uh, in just several different plots here and there, I messed around with it a few times. And it seems to do well, even if you're planting towards the end of November, as long as you have enough of a, a dry spell. Mm -hmm. to um, to get in there, but uh, just be no-till those peas in there. Yeah. And what that'll give us is a nice established uh, cover crop across all the all the ground instead of maybe a patchy result with the, with the clover if you had the grass. Yeah. And what that also does secondarily is pushes that field or that farm uh, into a different uh, termination yeah. uh, window as far as the cover crop. Peas will come on later. It's towards the end of May is when they're starting to really mature and really grow. The clover is usually, it's, it's the beginning, it's the beginning of May and you have about a week or a week and a half or so is your window to get it down. And the peas hopefully, you know, will split up our, 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 our budget for our time. We usually have a crunch there if everything's in clover. And what we have, a, what becomes a logistic issue is trying to get everything done at the same time. Uh, and what happens is we have weather intervenes and things fall behind. And what happens, so uh, breaking it up and staggering our corn production uh, by the, the legume maturity, I think is gonna help us get a, a grasp on our, um, whatever we start with, we can take care of. And then once uh, the, the later crops are ready, and that ground is ready, we can take care of them then. And also working with peas a few times, it tends to, it, once it starts flowering, it's not done. It's viney, like, kind of like that, it wants to keep growing. So. If, if, uh, if, you're, if it's ready to, to be, if you got enough nitrogen, if you go out there and, and sample it and you say, oh, I've got, I've got 80, 90 pounds. Well, oh, the weather doesn't look good. Well, I can wait because it'll keep growing. I've got a little larger window. It gives me more flexibility when it's time to do something about it. Mm -hmm. So essentially you're using cover crops for both the nitrogen production for your cash crop and the weed control, which, uh, which is really a key component no matter you're organic or not. But um, one thing I really like what you said, how you're very intentional in not planting all your acres in cover in, excuse me, crimson clover, because that limits you to pretty much one sweet spot in planting. And that's, I like to say that the profit in cover cropping or the profit in soil health principles is in the management. And that kind of is, is makes my point right there, what you just said. So, and I think that's an important uh, thing that you mentioned there is how you manage your cover crops is, uh, is very important. So, uh, Jen, is there, a, is there a question for Steve before we move on to Blaine? Absolutely. Anything? I think the questions that we have, we can get to in the open section okay. after. Okay, well, let's, move, let's move on to Blaine. I see Blaine's hooked up with his iPhone there. Uh, so that's <laughs> great. Uh, so Blaine is from Laurel, Delaware and um, Little different topic here. He's using biological amendments like humic acid, and be interested to hear maybe what else you're using to improve soil health and profitability. And it's been my experience that sometimes uh, biological amendments get the term snake oil attached to them. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and actually, I think we all agree there are some that really are good and some that maybe are in that snake oil category. So. Uh, Blaine, tell us what you're doing and maybe eventually tell us how do you uh, determine what's snake oil and what actually works. So if you want to give a little brief introduction of your farm, how much you farm and everything, but um, it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about that aspect. Oh yeah. Well, I'm um, located here in Sussex County, Delaware, and um, we till like a thousand acres of land and got six chicken houses and poultry is our bread and butter as you know farming is skeptical right now and um we we got into these humics and fulvic acids like three years ago and um for the most part 
I've learned that if you use them correctly, you can cut your inputs drastically by getting more efficiency out of your fertilizers. And if you apply them, especially where we apply chicken manure and have applied it for numerous years, it starts breaking down the phosphoruses and all your micronutrients that are in your soil that are locked together. Because humix is one of the main topics of it, is it's a buffering agent to get the sodium out of your soil. And as we know, all of our Roundups and fertilizers and they're loaded with sodium. Mm. So that's one of the biggest things we're seeing out of this because it's buffering these um, sodiums that's in our fertilizers and it makes them more available to our plant immediately. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the interesting fact and part of this humic mm. side of it. So um, what, do we, what do you say to a farmer who's heard about these red bee advertisements and might be skeptical? Um, how do you sift through it? What, what do you recommend? How do you find the, the good ones? How do you find the good ones? Well, you got to find the farmer that believes in the right ones because the typical salesman out here, they're just selling the product they have. And they most of the time, they don't know how to use it. And if you, when you've worked with them for four or five years and you've learned placement of them is the biggest key, getting it around the seed and on the plant, is the most efficient way of doing it. Mm -hmm. you, um, you have to believe in the person that you're getting it from, more or less. Yeah, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm negative. I use them myself. Um, uh -huh. I just know what's out there, and I know the oh, questions yeah. that people have. Uh, the other thing, too, I might just add, Blaine, I think you're going to agree that how you handle the product, I mean, it, you don't want to sit a jug of of these things out in the sunlight, uh, for Absolutely instance, not. Hot, that can kill all the microbes and critters that are in there. So there's a, there's a, a few little things that you, you have to understand. You're working with biological life and you got to treat it as such. And I, I like it this way. You can't go wrong if you treat your biologicals like you do yourself, right? Yep. Because that's really, their sweet spot is in the 70 degrees, just like us. That's <laughs> human beings, we like 70s. So if you think about your biological store them, everything about them in, in that, if that's helpful. I mean, am I, am I correct or? Absolutely. I idealistic? And now the, um, the company that I'm actually working with, they narrowed down which bacillus do the proper work for your uh, phosphorus, your nitrogen, your nematodes and potash um, needs. Mm -hmm. And now with what we're learning, it's, um, competitive exclusion where these products can actually buffer off nematodes, fusariums and pythiums in the soil because there's enough microbe count in the product to push them away from the plant. Mm. It's, it's really nice, neat technology that's coming down the pipeline. So how do you see using biological amendments in the context of, we'll say regenerative agriculture principles, use of cover crops, re reducing tillage? Uh -huh. How do you see that? How do they fit in that context? Well, they're going to fit into the place of um, plant health. If you use them strategically for plant health, your plants are going to be stronger. You're not going to have to use nowhere near as much fertilizer mm -hmm. because it enhances that plant to put off more roots, to create mm -hmm. more sugars, to create more microbes, and it, it makes it work. Mm -hmm. So. Just on that note, what have you experienced? Like, can you give an example that now that you use humic acid or whatever biological amendment is that you use, what, 30 pounds less nitrogen, 50 pounds, or whatever else you put on? I mean, can you give a little example of how it actually has worked on your experience? Oh, absolutely. Last, um, last year on the, a particular farm, we were, um, we were at 50% less nitrogen okay. and obtained the same yield as we did in prior year, years. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm going after because I'm still using um, cover crops, my rye, my vetches, my radishes, mm -hmm. and I'm planting green. So I'm okay. getting all of my nitrogen, a lot of my nitrogen out of that source. Yeah. And we're using, we're actually applying these humix in the fall on our cover crops to get them bigger, to get them to have more root mass so that they can absorb more nitrogen and make it more available. Yeah. Well, any of you have heard me speak, I always say you got to treat your cover crops like your cash crops. 
Yep. And that's what I'm talking about right there. And yep. I've always got contemplated that is, you know, how can we use our cover crops to uh, maybe get more fertility that's beyond just what those cover crops actually do? And I think what I hear you saying by, uh, by, by applying these products in the fall when the cover crops are growing, that's going to carry over into your cash crops, correct? Absolutely. Yep. And it gives the cover crop more time to break down the soil to get it in the plant. Right. The more the more roots you have, the better it is. So on your do, cover crop. What other ways do you use the biologicals? Uh, do you use them in the seed seed furrow? Do you put them on the seeds, like as a seed treatment, or what are other ways that you use these amendments? Um, actually, this year we went to an in furrow through insecticide boxes on our planter mm -hmm. with a granular type. Okay. And then we also use it if we apply liquid nitrogen. We blend it with it in a liquid form. Mm -hmm. Every time I spray post application, I got humic or fulvic acid in there with it mm -hmm. to make the chemicals buffer the salts that are in. The humic will buffer the salts that's in our um, roundups so the plant can digest it better. Okay. And it's one of these products, I use it all the time. With every application, if we're putting nitrogen on through our irrigation, I've got, I've got it in there with it. Well, um, here's another question that uh -huh. some farmers, I mean, you've heard of compost teas and things like that. The oh, farmers yeah. kind of can make their homemade brews, I'll say. Absolutely. And certainly some validity out there. I've always kind of been on the sidelines of that. My, my attitude has been maybe I'm a little bit too pessimistic, but, you know, once you guys get that figured out, I'm interested. Oh, yeah. I've heard, I've yeah. heard pros and cons with the compost teas, but want to comment on on that um your compost teas and homemade things versus what you can buy you know from a i'll say a reputable company well i've never had the opportunity to work with the compost teas or what other people are making i started with this particular company three years ago and um i've kind of been on with them ever since and mm -hmm. with their scientists helping me along the way teaching me how to use them and mm -hmm. when to use them that's what i've that's how I've come into this. Yeah. So I hear very yep. clearly that you have joined up, we'll say, with a trusted company. What would yes. you What would you recommend to people who are listening to this uh, webinar? Where could they start? Because there's there's <laughs> I'm going to say a dozen or more that you could you could contact. I know. Where do you start here so you don't get the snake oil? Um, where do you start? Well. I'm, I don't know if I'm to put, I ain't, I'm an actual distributor for humic acids. Uh -huh. And um, I mean, it's a, I'm into it for the right reasons though. I've got numerous farmers on board with me using it. And um, it's an amazing product when you know how to use it correctly. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. And I've, I've used, before I got on board with this company, I used some from a well-known chemical company. Mm -hmm. And um there's a big difference in quality. Yeah. And when you're going after quality, that's how these products work. So do you recommend that farmers do any type of a trial on their own farm and their own Yes. Fields? I mean, how, how would you approach that? Absolutely, because that is how you sell it to yourself. That's how I've done it with myself four years ago in mm -hmm. my two by two fertilizer. Mm -hmm. I mixed it in with my two by two versus none. Mm -hmm. And our first leaf samples come back drastically different okay. I said well that's the only thing different that I've done on this block of land and mm -hmm. it was in the same field so there's no soil texture differences okay. it um and I was like well next year I'm going 100 percent across yeah. the board yeah because I saw it and then when I learned more about it that the plant needs it just as much as the roots to keep the plant healthy during the growing season mm -hmm. it helps keep the stress off the plant mm -hmm. yep mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I would certainly say that biologicals have come of age, um, whereas, mm -hmm. you know, 20 years ago, I, I actually, I think, I think it was a good 20 years ago, I had a salesman come in here, I never knew, them, never knew him, and he heard about me, and of course, he wanted to sell me, he actually gave me what he said was $3,000 worth of product, I had no idea, okay. he gave it to me, and actually, I don't really feel that's a great idea, even mm -hmm. from, I would be a salesman, because when you're given stuff, I get, I get it. You know, if you're given something and there's follow-up, 
that's one thing. But, you know, he gave that to me, and he just called me a time or two and never really stopped back. I didn't really know what I was looking for. So, you know, that's some of the experiences some of us have had. Um, oh, yeah. Out there. And it sounds like, you know, what you're with here has good support, and I think that's important. There's nothing better than uh, tapping into – you know, a farmer like yourself or other people who have had success in order to feel more confident in moving on. I think that's mm -hmm. important for those who are going to try it. Um, um, well, and uh, the neat thing with working with a, a direct company, everything that they come with new in age, you mm -hmm. automatically get it. Just like this year was the first year they had the five sets of bacteria implanted into the humic acid and sea kelp. Yep. And that is just a power pack energy mm -hmm. source for a for your crop yeah yeah and we've got we've got some pretty awesome crops right now i could show you mm -hmm. where we've run this stuff on soybeans and corn okay. and what other had other testimonials huh? i was just curious aside from um i know you got some vegetables down through the delmarva and so forth yep. um, i'm mm -hmm. sure there's applications there as well right oh absolutely you can put it actually Everything needs it because it's a carbon source. Humic mm -hmm. acid is a carbon source. Mm -hmm. Just like we're using our cover crops for a carbon source to store it in the soil, mm -hmm. this is an activated carbon that's immediately available to the plant. So, that's okay, I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate here, Blaine. Uh -huh. I hope you can take it because you're passionate and I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. So, you know, a guy like me, I'm big into cover crops, no till for a long time. Absolutely. My organic matters tripled. I. I've had all kinds of measurements and stuff done on my farm. My soil health is good. I've done the Cornell soil health score. I'm at the top. There you go. Why do I need a biological? You really don't. Okay. Because you're, and I'm going to be honest with you. I was going to say, I'm surprised to hear you say that, but you're, no, you're, you're now not. you're impressing me even more. So they, um, anything over three and a half to 4% organic matter, you, okay. you've got the soil structure there to do what you need to do. Yeah. The poor soils is what needs uh -huh. these these carbons. When you get down below 3%, your mm -hmm. organic carbon in your soil is going to be less than 1.5. And mm -hmm. that is what we're looking for here. So we've got some land that's in our organic matter, 1.5. Yeah. So that puts us at like 0 0.75, 0 0.60 organic carbon. Mm -hmm. And that land is what shines the most when we use this on our soil. Yeah. But, but when we use it on a plant as, a, as mm -hmm. the buffer of salts and whatnot, you could still use it then sure. to help your plant. Gotcha. But your soil is already booming with what you've done forever. Absolutely. I appreciate your honest salesmanship there. <laughs> well, that's, that's the way I've learned this. I mean, I've learned this to teach you, the, to teach the farmer the right way of using it. And... Some people need a lot of it and some people don't. Yeah, yeah, that's yep. good. Well, okay, it's been great to hear from all three of you. Um, I'm gonna ask Jen and if uh, maybe we can switch into some questions that may have come in. Um, uh, so Jen, what, what question do you, would you have and for which, which uh, panelists maybe he was attracted to? Um, we had some questions that people sent in when they registered, and we've had some specific questions that have come up uh, over the course of the discussion so far, so I'll mix a, a little bit of both. Um, so one that I'd like to start with is what is the single soil health practice that you have implemented that has made the most dramatic improvement in your operation? So that's well, one just, let's just go with Aaron, Steve, and, and maybe Blaine. Uh, you know, in answering the question, your single most important soil health practice that you've implemented. implemented. Aaron? Uh, just cover crops in general, I guess. I, I call it the, uh, the, the field levelers. Um, we have some uh, new land we just took on uh, last year, uh, had been no-tilled but not used with cover crops. And you can see where we have some light uh, soil and we have some heavy soil where I live. You see, can you can see the lighter land wilting, the lower land suffering from maybe too much moisture. Uh, with the soil health, with the cover crops, it just it makes the emergence more even. The crops are more even. They just it looks like it's just about the same soil type all the way across when you get your soil in shape. Uh, I attribute that to cover crops. All right, Steve. 
Yeah, cover crops uh, definitely for us in our operation here or, or really a purposeful cover cropping. I'll give a quick example. We combined crimson clover with rye on an early field um, that came out of corn and um, it was a great decision. We had tried something like that before, but nothing really serious, but this is 50 acres. When you try something on five acres, you tend to not pay too much attention to it when you've got 495 other acres you're doing <laughs> the way you've been doing it. But when you do 50, you tend to pay attention. This this worked out really well for us. It um, it was uh, the rye, still put down to the rates we typically do, but we're just straight rye, even the, the clover, because we just wanted to make sure we covered our bases in case one didn't pan out. But the clover came right up, filled any gaps, filled any of those niche uh, niche spots where the rye wasn't so good, rolled right down beautifully, it, uh, and it planted planted beautifully. And uh, we haven't had to touch the field once, uh, even with our high residue cultivators. So the purposeful cover cropping, and, and also just and thinking about cover crops a little differently, mixes especially. I, I'm, we're definitely looking at, into these legume and small grain uh, combinations for uh, no-till beans. Uh, that's uh, no-till, I guess would be the other half of that answer, no-till uh, farming practices for boosting that soil health, which of course in turn uh, fosters all that ecological activity that will build up those soil um, those soil properties that you're looking for anyway, all those humic acids and fulvic acids over time. Of course, it does take time. It does it takes that commitment, but it does work. It does happen. And as you you mentioned quickly, Steve, uh, about the uh, Cornell soil tests and health tests, we we do our soil tests every year. We don't haven't done any of those soil health tests per se, but we don't haven't, haven't actually seen any improvement in any really the numbers on our soil tests, but. I can tell you, you know, maybe not quantitatively, I don't have a great answer for you, but qualitatively, I can tell you that field was easy to manage. They save a lot of time. I could put my time where it was needed somewhere else, say the corn, which is still conventionally filled. And we can do a better job with our weed control and our planting and do the things we need to do at the beginning of the season. So the rest of the season is, uh, is basically a breeze. Yep. So Blaine, any, what's your biggest uh, soil health thing that you, you can credit? Um, starting with no-till and learning through the years of which cover crops to in place for which crop and sticking to it. Do not get off of the program. All right. Great. You know, that's the biggest thing to keep your soil moving is to never work it. Just no-till, <laughs> no-till, no-till. That's a good play on words yep. there, Blaine. <laughs> oh, it is. And yeah. it's, it's hard to do. Yeah. It's hard to do. Yeah. You know, okay, we do then. very minimal... We do very minimal tillage. Right. Yep. Okay, Jen, what other question uh, is next? I'm going to get into a more specific management question. Um, it was directed to Aaron, but I think everybody might have um, something to weigh in there. To know more about the different types of manure that you use and specifically what is best to boost phosphorus. Uh, the different types of manure, it's all poultry litter manure, but it's just as we get manure from different farms, the way they manage their chicken farms, the result is the manure quality isn't always the same. So therefore, we like to get something to where if it's got clumps, we'll actually at times run it through an apron spreader to break up the clumps so it spreads better and blends it with uh, some drier manure if it's wetter manure. Um, th those are the things that we do as far as different manures. It's, it's all poultry, but it's coming from different sources and it's in different kinds of condition when we receive it. And the idea is to make it all the same as best we can. Okay. Steve? Uh, yeah, our main source of nitrogen, I could say about maybe about half, as long as we have a good cover crop program with legumes, is poultry litter. Um, we just, we basically just try to source locally we have pretty consistent numbers from our analyses from the poultry litter and what we're what we're trying to do though is maintain a balance at least with the phosphorus the inputs versus the outputs okay so whatever you put on you take out with your corn that year and then the following year with your soybeans which doesn't have a uh, uh, an input a uh, litter input and you're trying to keep that in balance so the soil phosphorus hopefully generally stays about the same under any of those thresholds that here in Maryland uh, that they've designated for us and with our phosphorus management tools and the regulation. Blaine, how do you deal with manure and phosphorus issues? Um, we're a little behind the eight ball on the phosphorus issues. As you know, my grandfather and my father, they all used manure for 50 <laughs> years before I come in the picture. 
And um, some of our phosphoruses are off the chart. So we're actually cutting back on that land of where we're applying manure because we just got too much, too much phosphorus. Right. So, and we just balance it out with leaf samples and try to keep the plant health happy along the way. And using these cover crops, and that's what I can come back and honestly say, the cover crops come in late in the season. The vetches do, they come in like late July, early August. And it seems like our corn actually gets greener the longer it goes without applying, because we don't apply no nitrogen after V5 or V6. And the leaf samples, they come right in, still in the three and a half percent range up in August. Wow. So we're happy with that. All right. Next question, Jen. Uh, this one was for Blaine, but again, if anybody has uh, something to weigh in on, uh, thoughts on biochar? Mm. Biochar. Well, Justin Bieber tried it and it didn't work for him. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> no, seriously, I've never had no experience with it. Um, I've always strictly worked with humic and fulvic acids and that's that's where I'm going and I'm gonna stay right here because I know it works. Bill or, or Steve or Aaron, do you guys have any experience with biochar? I do not. Okay, Steve? Uh, no, same here. All I, I think I know just a little bit about it. It is very, I think it's energy intensive to produce it. Yeah. Um, although it does have a lot of these you know, great quality soil amendment qualities, you still need quite a bit of it to produce it. And it's only made in small, small amounts, like I said, I think energy intensive and I think you're better off going through the cover crop no-till or minimum till route in building your soil health that way than, than a biochar amendment um, yeah. would, would yeah. offer you. And I, and I hear, you know, raving reviews about it and everything. And I think for, if you want to take a very poor field and remediate it quickly, using biochar could be a use for it. Um, and again, this is my personal opinion. I'm just going to put it out there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's a good product. I'm not sure how it's, you know, the best, most effectively used. I haven't seen a good reason to use it in my farm. Um, but that being said, we hear about it. It's being discussed. It's out there. Um, so I think, I guess, none of us really have much experience on it. But um, I think we'll probably hear more about it uh, in the future. There'll probably be some good places for it. But. Okay, Jen, next. Next question. Um, for Blaine again, how do the granular humic acids compare to the liquid? Ah. Okay. <clears throat> when, you, when you get a granular... Humic acid, it is in a 99% purity, where most of your liquids, most of the time, they're at the most, are 12%. Mm -hmm. So when you're applying a 99% granular, you're getting a lot more efficiency out of it mm -hmm. directly to the soil. And granulars work extremely better than liquids do when they are put in furrow or around that seed bed where you want them. All right. Yep. Another question? Um, getting back to some of the more general questions, has anybody considered adding grazing livestock to the crop rotation to improve soil health? Huh. Let's, let's start with Aaron, Steve, and Blaine. Uh, no, I have not. Uh, we used to uh, milk cows and used to grow rye just for the cows to graze on. Um, but <clears throat> We currently doesn't don't have any animals to graze on it, so it just hasn't been anything uh, that I've considered recently. What about you, Steve? Uh, no, we don't use any animals uh, currently. Uh, it's a possibility in the future, just like many farms uh, back in the day. Well, at least when my uh, my father-in-law was farming, they had a small dairy here. Yes, they had cows included in the rotation, along with alfalfa and some other forages and things like that. I'd like to see use the opportunity with grazing animals to diversify my cover crops even more. A lot of those grazing species had a, are a nice addition and complement a lot of other, all the other species and filling uh, niches uh, in terms of your soil health and weed suppression. And just really in terms of uh, well, back to weed suppression and just throwing a curveball towards uh, uh, for the for weed control. A lot of these, I, my personal belief that uh, grazing pressure and a lot of that traffic, if you do it correctly, Mm -hmm. uh, would could suppress a lot of those uh, broadleaf annuals 
uh, mm -hmm. such as uh, pig, uh, pigweed and even palmer, which seems to be making itself its presence more known around the area. Any animals in your farm, Blaine? Other than chickens, no. <laughs> no, we're, we've never been into cattle. We used to have hogs, but we're not into the grazing side of the yeah. story here. Yeah. Yep. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, one just came in, what is the optimal time to apply humic acid? I believe that would be for Blaine. Yeah, any time, because your soil, if it's in need of it, it's going to use it when you apply it. But the best time to apply it is when you're planting. Yep. Can, can you explain a little bit more because, I mean, do you ever broadcast it or you say with planting, if it's granule, I think you said insecticide boxes going in the road. Yes. Is, is, there, is there a place for broadcasting? You know, if you have that option. Oh, absolutely. We um, if we broadcast our granular fertilizer, we have the granular in there with it, gotcha. and we also apply some with our insecticide boxes in furrow. So mm -hmm. we're covering our land just as much as we are in furrowing it. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, because you're still working on your whole soil structure mm -hmm. when you're applying it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, Jen. You have some more questions. Um. So I think uh, everybody kind of touched on this a little bit, but I just want to come back to it and reiterate, what is the one piece of advice that you would give someone who is just starting on the soil health journey? Well, let's go down our order here. Um, Aaron, this is, we kind of covered a little bit before, but soil health, the big, the big, let's just call this the big, the big mindsets, <laughs> you know, sometimes that gets in the way, but, uh, you know, for someone who's like, you know what, I'd like to get into this. So what would you recommend? I think the biggest thing with this is you have to take this with a, with a, a, a lot of thought approach. And you can't think that cover crops are something you just throw out there that's just going to get benefit from. It takes a lot of management. It takes a lot of thought, thought about your species you're choosing or maybe even your mixes. And there's going to be challenges along the way. There's going to be things you learn along the way not to get discouraged, but keep moving forward because what works for somebody may not work as well for you depending on soil types or what you're trying to target. Um, so the biggest thing is it, it has to be a whole systems approach to cover crops and do not get discouraged. Just keep trying. You'll work your way through it. Steve. Yeah, I, I agree with what Aaron just said. It's not really, it can't be a rubber stamp approach. You have to be flexible with your cover crops. You have to you have to look at your operation to see where you need to make gains. You have to look at soil health like a, a, a more like a journey. It's not really a destination. It's a commitment. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think you touched on that. You got to be willing to try a few new things. I think even every year on somewhere, uh, try a new uh, cover crop, try a new uh, mixture, try a new incorporation method, um, things like that that are going to you know that you can and do it in such a way that you can you'll be able to either see a benefit or you know say well that didn't work as well you know and you can you can know what you, then you might know if it doesn't work and you can you can move on from there okay blaine advice on beginner's soil health yeah same thing as the other two you have to be passionate about it you have to learn and you can you just cannot expect immediate results overnight okay it takes two to three years before stuff starts really transitioning. Mm -hmm. And when you start seeing it happening, you'll see it. Yeah. And that's why I, earlier when I said you have to stick to it and stick to it, yeah. you have to. It's the yeah, way it I works. Like to, I like to challenge people that if you're really committed to the thorough health journey, as Aaron said, think of it as 10 years, a 10-year commitment. And maybe it's not that you have to figure every year out, but it's the, it's the mindset that you got to go into it that, you know, don't expect all these wonderful, magical things happen just because you buy a bag of cover crop seeds. Uh, it, it's way, 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 way much more than that. But if you're going in with a mindset of a 10 year commitment, um, that's going to set you up for success because you really, really want to, again, I go back to the treating your cover crops like your cash crops, you know, treat them, you know, with, with a lot of trying to maximize their value, just like we do with our cash crops. And, and that's a good standard to, to go by. Uh, any more questions, 
uh, Jen, or should we open it up here in case anyone wants to ask the question live? Well, we are running short on time, so um, I well, I just we're coming to the end of our hour, um, and I wanted to maybe uh, just reiterate that we have I posted a link to the survey in the chat box, um, and we will make the recording of today's conversation available uh, to everyone. Um, and there's a question in there that I think I will ask everybody sort of offline and send out with the follow up as far as recommendations uh, for books and resources on soil health, where to go next. Um, so um, with that, uh, you know, but I think that the question that we had, you know, as far as like where people can start is sort of a good way to, uh, to wrap it up. So um unless anybody has any kind of closing words that they wanted to put out there um i just wanted to thank everybody for for coming again thank you absolutely i'll just say i'll just say that um is there anything else burning yet from you three panelists that you wish you could get in here keep it short i'll i'll add that i i've heard twice they've asked a question the one thing that really would be basically the smoking gun or the big thing. The only way I can kind of describe some of this for soil health is, is if you imagine a piece of a puzzle and somebody lays it out on a table, it's very confusing. You don't understand. You don't identify. You can only start putting the pieces together. And after a while, you, you, you've created a picture. Yeah. So it, it, there's so many pieces that have to come together, and there's a lot of learning that has to come in. It, it, it's hard. It's not easy at times, but it's also exciting. It's exciting to see the results and the crops and the responses that you get over time. So back to kind of what I was saying, you just have to be patient, try to read, learn, listen, and uh, try some things yourself. All right. Okay, anything from Steve or Brian really quick? To yeah, um, yeah, Aaron, that was a well said. The thing I would just add, um, just turn in from a cover crop uh, point of view, uh, that the biggest thing I've noticed with using them and using them correctly in a purposeful, purposeful mm -hmm. way, is uh, the hedge, almost a hedge against the, it seems like the, this weather uh, that we've been encountering over the past decade or even a little bit more, some of this variable weather, you know, these extremes, uh, especially mm -hmm. with, uh, with rainfall and things like that. The cover crops give you much more of a, a window to work in. It seems like the windows we have for planting and fitting fields and working grounds seem to be closing. And cover crops, I think, give us, help open that window a little bit more, give us a little more breathing room, at least from an organic production point of view. And I think that's, that's paying off uh, every year. And where we can, for some guys, have to wait because the field's tilled. If we're no-tilled, right, we can get in there a day sooner, maybe two days, if the stand is good. Because uh, we can, we sit up on top of the ground, we're not sinking in mud. Right. And um, that, that's the, the benefit I see. I, I like the word resilient. We're building more resilient soils to this method. So, Blaine, real quick, anything anything you wanna get in there? Yeah, I'd like to compliment the, the district on what they do for the farmer, because we're putting these meetings together for everybody to get on and listen to. And I encourage everybody interested in this to attend the workshops, to attend the meetings, because you will always learn a little something all the time from these. And every little thing you learn might fit into your project. I mean, that's how I've learned this and getting in touch with other farmers that are very intrigued about it. Mm -hmm. And um, it will move you down the road faster doing that versus just thinking about what you might want to do. Yeah. It'll help you make decisions on your own. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. good. Well, I, I thank all three of you who have joined here. I thought it's been very productive. Uh, Jen, thanks for inviting me on here to help out a little bit. And so appreciate serving. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Jen, to, to close her out. Lane, that was an answer after my own heart. And uh, I just want to thank everybody, uh, Steve, Steve, Aaron, and Blaine again. Uh, great job. And I appreciate everyone's expertise so much.